Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Houston. So I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon here in Houston. I work at Children's Memorial Hermann Hospital and MD Anderson, and we're part of the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. And you know, as a pediatric neurosurgeon who's been in practice for about 14 years, I've treated many, many patients with Chiari 1 malformation, as do all pediatric neurosurgeons. It's such a common entity to, 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 to encounter. I, truthfully, my research area is in brain tumors, and, and I wouldn't consider myself more of an authority on this topic than any other you know, busy pediatric neurosurgeon. I did publish one paper on the topic um, that was of interest to Dr. Maher, and, and that's why he asked me to speak to your group today. So that's what I'll speak about. Um, this was actually work that was done in my first faculty position when I was at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine in Miami Children's Hospital. Um, one disclosure was that a medical student working on the project um, was awarded a student research fellowship for this work, but no other relevant disclosures. So our objective was basically to try to contribute to the literature and further defining the natural history of Chiari 1 malformations that did not require surgery. And so I had always been taught going through residency and fellowship and seen in my practice that m many patients with Chiari malformation, Chiari 1 malformation specifically, suffer greatly and benefit greatly after surgical decompression. But there are many patients who have MRI scans that look exactly like those patients who are actually fine and who go through their life and they don't need any, any treatment. So the question was, what happened to those patients? And looking through the literature existing at the time, you know, the literature was actually more scant than it should have been, you know, given how common the disease entity is. So it was poorly defined in the medical literature. And these were the three best papers, in my opinion, um, back in 2010 when we were looking at this with relatively small numbers. So, <clears throat> you know, 22 patients followed, you know, most of whom didn't get surgery, three required surgery, um, many of their symptoms improved. This is very scant literature publication with 51 patients, one with 11 patients with syringomyelia who were followed, very small papers. So <clears throat> our outcome was in a busy pediatric neurosurgery practice to just retrospectively review all the patients who came through the door who did not get surgery, right? And so that was what we did. So we looked at 124 patients from uh, over a 10-year period who were managed non-operatively. During the same period, 54 additional patients were offered surgery. And so I think you can see in, in, in our practice at least, you know, Chiari malformation is more commonly diagnosed than it used to be because patients are getting MRI scans for, for many, many reasons. And most patients who walk through the door are not offered surgery in our practice. And I think my practice has trended even more in that direction. I would say in my current practice, for every 10 patients that walk through the door with an MRI scan that shows a QR1 malformation, probably, I haven't scientifically looked at it, but probably one or two of them get surgery and the rest are managed non-operatively. So we looked at imaging findings, symptoms, neurological examinations at presentation for the duration of follow-up. So in, in, this is a pediatric population. Obviously, Chiari was in adults as well, um, but this is the group that we treat. So ages uh, under one to, to up to almost 20, the mean was seven years. The follow-up was a minimum of a year. The mean was 2.8 years, and there was a wide range. You know, obviously, this is a big weakness because Chiari malformation, you know, is, is something that patients deal with through their whole life. So this doesn't say anything about what happens to a patient that we follow conservatively five years, 10 years, 20 years out. And that information is really nowhere in the medical literature. The mean tonsillar herniation was 8.35 millimeters with a wide range. Seven patients had a searing set presentation um, who were followed for various reasons. I'll get into that little, that later. Most of them were very small syringes. Um, and the mean tonsillar herniation in these patients was slightly slightly greater. None of the patients have had hydrocephalus because any patient who had hydrocephalus would be in the treated group in our practice and I assume in everybody else's practice. So <clears throat> at presentation, 43 of the patients were deemed asymptomatic. They had imaging studies performed uh, for other reasons and they had no symptoms or signs that could be attributed to Chiari malformation. 81 patients came with symptoms, and that was why they got the MRI scan, and the symptoms could have been related to Chiari. 67, in our judgment, the judgment of the pediatric neurosurgery group, um, the symptoms were not likely due to Chiari 1 malformation, things like diffuse headaches that were not, um, you know, localized to the 
to the back of the head, to the neck, not worse with valsalva maneuvers, no other signs or symptoms, et cetera. 14 patients, <clears throat> we felt that the symptoms were likely due to Chiari malformation, but in nine of them, they weren't so severe or really affecting the patient's life enough to warrant surgery. And five of the patients were offered surgery, but the parents refused. So in terms of the symptoms they actually presented with, it's sort of the typical <clears throat> symptoms that you would see in a, in a practice for patients with Chiari malformation. Most of them had headaches of some sort. 14 of them were posterior, 34 were non-posterior. Some presented with nausea and vomiting, a variety of sensory complaints, neck pain, a few of them gait disturbance, motor deficits, hyperreflexia, or syncope. So again, the mean tonsil herniation was 8.35 millimeters. The tons so in terms of what happens over time, right? So um, most of the patients, you'll see that the, the Chiari 1 malformation, in terms of its extent on imaging studies, doesn't change. So the tonsil herniation, reg her herniation regressed in six patients, and it progressed in four patients, and it was unchanged in all the remaining patients. So if, you, if the average patient, patient in your practice asks, what's going to happen radiographically to my Chiari 1 malformation if I don't have surgery, I think the answer is most likely it's going to stay about the same. It might, your tonsils might go a little higher, they might go a little lower, but most likely it's going to stay exactly the same. In terms of syrinx, seven had a syrinx of presentation. Some of them were quite wimpy, you know, ranging from 1.5, which is very small, to four millimeters in maximum diameter. Two were cervical, three were thoracic, two were cervical thoracic. Three of these patients had very mild scoliosis, a maximum of 10 degrees. One of these patients had a fatty phylum terminale. There were no other cases in which there was spinal dysraphism associated. So in terms of the searing size of these seven patients that were followed, um, the searing did not change in size over this time period. So that's a very small sample size and a short duration. So you know, not as meaningful as it could be with more patients and longer follow-up, but at least for this small group, the patients, um, the patient searings did not change. I think the more common question for parents who read up about Chiari malformation and know about the association between syrinx and the worrisome association because a syrinx can cause neurological deficits, um, I think patients and families want to know, is my child or am I going to develop a syrinx over time if I don't have surgery? And at least in our series, the answer is no. So the patients who didn't have a syrinx, there were no new syrinxes that developed or syringes that developed over the our duration of follow-up. But the caveat for that is that it's not routine in our practice to get subsequent imaging studies in patients who don't have a syrinx who are, you know, not deemed necessary to have surgery. So only 48 of those patients had subsequent imaging studies of the total spine to assess for syringomyelia. So this is a very small syrinx. Um, and there were some that a little, little bigger than that that were followed, but most of them were, were very small. 17-year-old girl presented with a headache, um, not typical of QR1. Tonsils are seven millimeters below the frame and magnum, neurologically intact. There are some neurosurgeons who, you know, in any degree of a syrinx, they would say that patient needs surgery. I mean, this is a particularly wimpy one, and some might argue maybe it's even a prominent central canal, but on the axials it looked, you know, like it was a real syrinx. Um, but, you know, for a very small syrinx, in my practice, I would follow a patient who's asymptomatic. So, in terms of results, there were no new deficits for the duration of follow-up in any patients whatsoever. So I think we can safely say to families, the great likelihood is nothing bad is going to happen other than perhaps worsening of headaches or whatnot. There's going to be no new neurological problems, you know, if we follow your child, if we deem them not necessary to have surgery at the outset. 42 of the 43 asymptomatic patients remained asymptomatic. One developed symptoms, but that, those symptoms were not attributed to the QR1 malformation. So of the 81 symptomatic patients, as we said, 67 had symptoms that were not attributed to QR1 malformation. Those symptoms improved or resolved in 29 patients. They remained stable in 26 patients. They worsened in 12, but they were still not symptoms that would be described as typical of QR1 malformation. Of the 14 patients who were not um, operated upon, who had symptoms attributable to QR1 malformation, there was an improvement in six patients, stabilized in four patients, and worsened in, in four patients. Of the five patients who we said, you know, if this were my child, I would do surgery, um, but the parents didn't want to, the symptoms improved in two patients and worsened in three, but even in the three who worsened, the parents still did not consent to surgery. So the conclusions of this study 
were that um, the majority of patients followed conservatively do not progress clinically or radiographically. In other words, it's safe to watch patients who have a QR1 malformation. I mean, I think that's been substantiated in other papers as well, particularly Cormac Maher's paper about athletic participation, looking at so many seasons of athletic participation without new neurological deficits, et cetera. Many weaknesses of this study, retrospective, short follow-up, inconsistent follow-up, both in terms of clinical follow-up and imaging. Many of the patients did not have subsequent imaging studies at all. So subsequent studies, which are worth citing um, since ours, was a study done by Dr. Maher and his colleagues at the University of Michigan where they followed even more patients, 147 patients for at least a year. Nine of them developed symptoms over that time attributed to QR1 malformation. Eight developed the syrinx. So that's different than our study in which there were no new syringes that developed. Um, so they had a small number that did develop a syrinx. Five of these had a pre-syrinx state or dilated central canal. The syrinx, they, the syrinx resolved in three patients, and there was, similar to our study, no significant change in tonsillar herniation over time. Of these patients who were initially followed, 14 wound up requiring surgery, and two of them had possible neurological worsening, which led to the surgery. So ours had zero. This group had two. Their study was a little bit larger. Another good study um, in terms of conservative management was from the University of Virginia group, in which, and that was more recent in 2018. They followed 95 pediatric patients with QR1, 25 underwent surgery, 70 were followed conservatively for a mean of 44 months. Of those patients, so 20 patients, 41% had symptom improvement, 92% had no clinical or radiographic worsening. There were two patients with syrinx in the non-surgical group um, that did not resolve, and, and three patients who developed a new syrinx. So I wasn't sure exactly who my audience was for this talk, whether it was a group of scientists or lay people or both, um, but I thought I would use my, you know, this to lead into a discussion of, you know, the controversial area of who requires surgery, right? And I think that's something that plagues all of us as pediatric neurosurgeons because there's a lot of difference in philosophy of neurosurgeons around the country or around the world, and there's a lot of confusing information on the internet for patients. And so, you know, this is the way I think about it anyway. So I think there are certain patients in which the overwhelming majority of us would agree that surgery is not required. Discovered incidentally, asymptomatic, no syrinx or any other, you know, signs of spinal dysraphism or anything like that. So, and I think, you know, if we're operating on this patient, we're going to be operating on, on a lot of people who, who don't need surgery. Chiari malformation is present in 0.77% of the general population, um, as noted in this study from 2000. So I think most of us would agree that patients who have headaches that are not posterior and not associated with Valsalva maneuvers, who are normal neurologically and don't have a syrinx, <clears throat> should be observed and not offered surgery. <clears throat> so when you get to the areas that are more controversial, I would put this in the possibly category, right? So patients who are not clearly symptomatic, but they have a syrinx, right? Many of us believe that that can lead to neurological deficits. But I guess the devil's in the details. How big should that syrinx be to offer surgery, as I alluded to? So if it's a 2 millimeter syrinx, if it's 8 millimeters, that's been answered at least in a survey led by, you know, Paul Steinbach back in, 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 in 2004. So if you ask a group of neurosurgeons internationally, you know, if you have an asymptomatic patient with a QR1 and a two millimeter wide syrinx, so only a minority would offer surgery. If you take that same syrinx and you make it eight millimeters, the overwhelming majority would offer surgery in an asymptomatic patient. Again, in the possibly category, <clears throat> patients who have headaches that we would attribute typically to a QR1 malformation. So they've got suboccipital headaches without a syrinx, and how, or how about with a two millimeter syrinx? So, at least according you know, to Dr. Steinbach's survey, a slight majority without a syrinx with suboccipital headaches would offer surgery. And if you add a little syrinx, that goes up to 84%. Whether this is what people actually do in their practice versus what they just say in the survey you know, is unknown. Again, in the possible category, how about a patient with QR1 malformation 
and progressive scoliosis. Scoliosis with these patients is typically associated with a syrinx, but there, is, there are some patients who present with scoliosis without a syrinx for reasons which I'm not sure, but there is an association. Um, not clearly symptomatic from the QR malformation. Well, again, we have no idea what we're actually supposed to do, at least based upon the survey, where a slight majority, 57%, would offer surgery, but you know, that means we don't know what we're doing, basically. This is a hard category for me. Um, how about infants and young children who have significant hindbrain herniation without a syrinx but can't express their symptoms well? You know, some of them have really typical symptoms. They're arching their neck all the time. They're absolutely miserable. They have a significant Chiari. And at least in my practice, I would offer surgery to that patient, and I've seen great benefit in terms of resolution of those symptoms. But what about the kid who's just irritable all the time or says they have headaches or is pointing to their head all the time? and they're two, three years old, and they can't really localize it, um, that's a tough one because you know, we, we, you know, we don't know for sure whether to offer surgery. My current clinical practice is I err on the side of being conservative in those patients. I err on the side of not offering surgery and you know, follow them both clinically and perhaps with imaging and, and, and see what happens over time. How about a patient with greater than five millimeters of hindbrain herniation, no syrinx, but headaches that are just debilitating, that are diffuse in location with no other etiology found, unresponsive to medical management. So this is the patient who comes to my office who has a Chiari 1 malformation who I don't offer surgery to because the headaches don't seem typical of Chiari. They don't have a syrinx. They're neurologically intact. But then they go to 16 other people. They go to see neurologists. They go to pain specialists. They cannot get, a, an, an, they cannot get relief of their symptoms with any medical therapy. Um, the families are at wit's end. And you know they they're convinced it's the QRI malformation, you know, and they're begging you to, to to do surgery. What are we supposed to do with these patients? I don't actually really know. I'll take advice from the rest of you. So, in conclusion, I think we can say both from my study and the existing medical literature that there are patients whose symptoms are not attributed to QRI one, who don't have the syrinx, who don't have neurological deficits, who can be safely followed without surgery. It is a safe option to be conservative, not certainly, I think we can agree that not every patient with a QRI1 malformation needs surgery. And it's so interesting that the same MRI scan can be attached to one patient who is completely asymptomatic and another patient who has absolutely classic signs and symptoms of QRI malformation and whose life improves dramatically after a posterior fossa decompression. The natural history of QR1 malformation most commonly does not include a major change in tonsillar descent or neurological worsening. Of course, there will be exceptions to any rule in medicine, but I think we can say that safely from the existing medical literature. And that in general, patients who are followed radiographically um, or clinically are not going to have a new syrinx form if they didn't have one before. Um, and worsening of an existing syrinx is possible, but it's probably not that common. So this is our medical center here in Houston. Um, welcome, I hope you all enjoy being here and I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has.